I'm Esther Enkin. I'm executive editor of um, CBC News, and I am also here as vice president of um, the Canadian uh, Journalism Forum on Violence and Trauma, so all, you can see where it all connects. Um, it's great to see so many of you here, and I, I know that you're going to find the evening incredibly worthwhile. Um, our speakers tonight are going to share their thoughts, experience, and insights working with survivors and, and um, vulnerable people. Uh, unfortunately, it is our stock and trade, um, conflict and trauma, and, and we tell our stories through the people who are the victims of that. Um, in the case of our guests tonight, most of them have worked, uh, worked sort of retrospectively with uh, historical uh, events. Nevertheless, for most of you, especially just starting out, likely um, you know, on a, in a local publication, unfortunately, uh, it still pertains. Uh, local communities have all kinds of trauma <coughs> and violence, um, and you will be called upon to elicit the stories of the people who are involved. Um, and so as, as, uh, as journalists, we have a duty to truth-telling and bearing witness but when those witnesses are highly vulnerable, like, like the people that we'll be talking about tonight, uh, what are ethical and moral, we have ethical and moral obligations to them. We have an obligation to tell their story and to help, help people understand what happened and, and to bear witness, but we also have an obligation to them. So how do we give voice to the voiceless without further damaging them in the process? I recently read an account of a, a group of military women in the US who had formed a group to advocate, uh, you know, basically taking on the U.S. military establishment. Uh, they were all uh, victims of really horrific and, and, and long-term sexual abuse and harassment in the military, and they had taken on this culture. And so they were talking about dealing with the media and how important it was to, be, to have people step forward and, 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 uh, and tell the story. And, they, and the writer of the article, which was very sensitive, but referred to what one of the women referred to herself as she was responsible for the casting call. I found that very jarring, and what she meant was when journalists come knocking, you know, give me a body, give me a story, you, you, it, it always has to be more than that. Maybe it's a pretty honest way of doing it because the best way to access stories is through, is through individuals, it makes it real, but it's a, a really, for me, it was a real reminder that this is not about somebody playing a role, but a life lived, and a life lived with, with enormous trauma. So, um, you know, uh, I'm sure that after you hear the experience and wisdom of, of uh, our speakers tonight, you will feel better equipped to approach people who have been traumatized, whether, and there are differences, which I hope we'll get into, whether it happened last week or decades ago, nevertheless, the pain and the, and the trauma remains. And I hope you'll be more confident to approach those stories with, with uh, respect. And here's the other really good news. I mean, I'm, I'm very involved in, in teaching and talking about ethics and journalism. And in this, as in all things, an ethical, sensitive, humane approach to this will elicit better journalism. As Bob Steele, who's one of my mentors, at the pointer says, you know, great ethics plus good craft, and that's the ability to ask the good questions, equals great journalism. So you're going to come out of here better equipped and with a better understanding of the people you talk to. So very quickly, before I take up the rest of the time, um, I'm going to quickly introduce you to our panelists. Uh, I'm actually going to start on the far end. Ted Barris, uh, who probably many of you know because you're his students, um, is an author, journalist, and broadcaster, and he's done stints on a variety of CBC radio programs. I've probably prepared a green or two for him somewhere along the way, or a newscast. Well, and uh, he's been a, a contributor to The Globe, The National Post. He's had his own column for upwards of 20 years and, of course, is the author of numerous nonfiction books, uh, many of them involving the, t the uh, stories of, of uh, Canadian veterans, everything from Vimy to, I guess, your most latest book, uh, Ted, is Breaking the Silence, which is the untold stories from the Great War to Afghanistan, which is quite the range. Um, and while I was reading up on Ted, I also found out he's an eclectic guy with lots of interest in sports and music as well. So he's a man of many talents. Next to him is Professor Andrea Litvak, who is director of the MSW program at the Factor in Wintosh? Oh, Faculty of Social Work, I'm in broadcasting, University of Toronto. 
She's taught clinical courses at the school since 1990, and she is currently, you know, she's, she's, uh, we're, 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 we're bringing her into our wonderful world because she's uh, currently going to be uh, scheduled to teach a course on deep interviewing for the fellows uh, in the Global Journalism Program at the Monk uh, School of International Affairs at U of T. Um, and finally, Caroline Davidson. Caroline is also a fellow, a former fellow colleague at CBC, working for Quirks and Quarks and various art shows, has been associated with the Israeli Foundation, uh, interviewing Holocaust survivors. And is currently, I, mean, I do apologize, I can't That's say okay. no, my, my, uh, I, I'm actually a travel writer now. <laughs> but prior to that, I was the director of programming at Discovery Channel and all the digitals. Um, and I, I had my Grab own that mouth. microphone. Oh. I had, um, can people not hear me? <laughs> I think it's pretty that with the fans and everything. Really you can, not okay. Can you hear me now? Okay, uh, very quickly. I uh, spent uh, uh, 15 years at CBC as an arts and science journalist. Uh, I had my own television show at TVO, interviewing scientists. Um, and then I helped start up Discovery Channel and the Digis, um, and was director of programming there for a decade. And now I um, freelance, uh, and I'm a travel writer. Which is See what happens <laughs> when you, you know you need a break from the intensity yeah. of this work. So, but um, okay, that's it. Yeah. So now we're gonna we're gonna get started, and to get I thought we thought that the best way to to approach this is with anecdotes, with individual stories. So I'm gonna ask each one of you. Um, starting with, with Carol, to tell us about an encounter with a subject that illustrates some of the challenges uh, there is in doing this kind of work. Because it's not the same as sort of work-a-day um, interview. Um, this, I think I'm perhaps the least experienced uh, on the board in dealing with um, this kind of situation. Because basically I'm a, an arts journalist and, um, and a science uh, journalist. Um, but I got involved with, um, it was a co-production really, I suppose, uh, between the Asriali Foundation um, of Montreal and the Ryerson School of Continuing Studies, and they asked for volunteers to uh, interview Holocaust survivors to help them write their memoirs, and they're now being made into books. Um, so I volunteered, and I ended up um, spending a great deal of time with a uh, former child Holocaust survivor. This man uh, from Czechoslovakia was about 11 years old when he was in the camps, and um, that was really my only experience with that kind of situation. And even though I'm a veteran interviewer, and I had no fear of interviewing anybody ever. From the very first interview I ever did when I was in my early 20s, I entered this situation with a great deal of trepidation, and it was one of the most uh, harrowing and yet rewarding experiences of my life. And so what were some of the, the, the things that were unique about the experience, the challenge of getting this person well, to Well, for, to first of all, I mean, any, 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 person, any person you're going to interview, you have to do your research. You just, uh, it's just a respectful thing to do, and it, it, it helps to uh, focus what, you know, what you'd like to go to the interview. I did quite a bit of, of uh, interviewing just about um, where he came from. I knew a little bit about him uh, prior to the interview, and I actually went back to look at uh, the maps, and especially in Czechoslovakia during the war and pre-war, Czechoslovakia kept, you know, moving around. I mean, it was divided and reunited so many times, and just to try and understand the environment in which he lived even before the war, and the kind of life he may have lived, and then what happened. So when I went to visit him, he, first of all, he was a a very, very charming, gracious man. Huge smile on his face, which helped a great deal. I mean, he he made me feel at home, which was helpful. Um, but um, he he's still scarred from what happened to him. And I think one of the the most painful um, revelations to me was that, uh, and still. Um, 
make springs into tears is that uh, he had two sisters, one of whom was taken by the Gestapo um, to be sent to Auschwitz. And um, because she was young, her sister sacrificed herself so that her other sister could be free. And so it was very difficult um, to, to hear him tell that. And you know, it's, it's so tough. And you, you have to be human when you're with them, but you can't, I mean, I'm, I, I was almost brought to tears just telling it now, but you, you cannot, should not cry with the person. You have to be able to divorce yourself just a, a little bit, be compassionate, but not, you know, completely give in to your emotions because it, empathy is important and compassion is extremely important. But you want him to tell his story and it should be his tears, not yours. For now. <laughs> Do you want to talk about some of your experiences? Especially around when, if you sense that people, in the challenge where, where you sort of sense people are comfortable going so far, no further, and yet you feel there's something else you need to elicit that's an important part of the story. In the research for the uh, Breaking the Silence book, um, I hadn't anticipated until quite late in the process that I would run into Afghanistan veterans who were willing to talk. But by coincidence, one of the Canadians who witnessed the friendly fire incident, this is the incident in April of 2002 when a training exercise in the middle of the desert about five kilometers from Kandahar was bombed by two American or an American pilot killing four Canadians. And uh, ironically, two of the witnesses to that event had connections to the town in which I live in Unsbridge. Um, one was the son of the volunteer fire chief, and he had gone to school with my daughters, mm. and I was able to gain access to uh, his experience. We sat for many hours. But the more interesting one, for the purposes of this discussion, was a man named Brian DeCare, who was the nephew of the woman who runs the bookstore in my town. So she convinced him to allow me to interview him, and he came over to my home. This is about perhaps four or five years after the incident, perhaps 2007. And I don't think he was too pleased with the idea. He came to the house and I had cleared everybody out of the house, everybody get out, I just want to have room for him and me. And I saw him at the entrance to uh, our home and he looked like a deer in the headlights. He was scared to death of me. Came in and he had a sheaf of papers under his arm. And I said, relax, I'm not looking for dirt. I just want to get some sense of your experience so that he could recount what he'd seen. And he was about 20 meters from where the bomb landed and took shrapnel through his hand and into his face. By the time I saw him, he was completely recovered. He sat at the kitchen table and took about eight or 10 sheets of paper and put them out on the table around my tape recorder. Mm -hmm. And they were handwritten notes on the sheets of paper to all the questions he expected me to ask him. Mm -hmm. And so I started, and every question I asked, I found a piece of paper, found the answer, and read it. Put it down. Next question, next sheet of paper. This went on for quite some time. Until I finally found a question for which there was no answer on sheets. And the question was, what did the bomb sound like? And he said, and he said, and he looked rather, he was frightened because the answer wasn't on the sheet. And he said, you're going to laugh. And I said, try me. He said, you know those Roadrunner cartoons mm. where the bird is running and the wily coyote is chasing? And he starts to smile and he claps his hands <coughs> together. He says, you know the sound of the anvil coming down out of the heights and hitting the wily coyote? That's what it sounded like. And he laughed. And I didn't. Mm. And we broke through the paper, the barrier, the defensive response to questions. And that was the challenge for me, was to find a way through to his witnessing that event in raw, ad-lib terms, and they began to come. And um, I respected his wishes as a journalist 
when he said stop the tape recorder. I don't want this recorded. And Is that generally when, your practice? Yep. If they if they ask me that, and I and I sense it's not it doesn't advance the story in any, to any large degree, I respect it. I do it anyway. Uh, I knew what the, the answers to some of those questions were. In any case, um, the challenge was to make him feel at ease with me, um, sense that I respected what he'd gone through, and there were a few tears on both our part. Do you parts. agree with Caroline about this idea that, that, that you, you empathize but don't go the whole distance there? I don't hold back if I sense that, I mean, I express what I feel and if I felt moved by something and the man or woman was tearing up or worse and I felt that way I didn't hold back I, you know I want them to understand that I'm being as honest with them as they are with me yeah, but I, I, I understand I, what you're saying yeah I, I, I don't think it has to do with the honesty I think it has to do with I mean you can tear up as I just did but you can tear up as, as I just did because it's natural but um, you have to also allow them their moment too without you know, upstaging it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's what I meant. So it's always a bit of a balance. Yeah, it? it's always. And uh, the other thing I, it just occurred to me um, you know, when, when a person is telling their story, just kind of uh, remembering moments and time frames, et cetera. You know, people don't always remember. You don't even remember what you did today, necessarily, from moment to moment, especially when you're thinking back 40, 50 years. So you want to let them tell their story, uh, especially when you're writing their memoir. It's not just a short interview. It's a whole memoir of their life. So you realize that you have to let them tell their story. You don't want to interrupt them. But on the other hand, you have to bring them back a little bit. You let them go and uh, you bring them back if you see a path that's, that's interesting, that's leading kind of in a narrative, hopefully chronologically. But don't rein them in if they're going somewhere, if they're jumping ahead, just make a note of it and then perhaps come back to say 1944, even if they've gone ahead to 46. I mean, the hard, as difficult as it is to interview someone in that situation, it's also um, it's also hard work to put chronology together afterwards with all if you're going off in all directions. But that's but that's what you have to do. You don't want to keep them to a timetable. You want to let them go in different areas. But one important thing, because I wanted not just the chronology, but the uh, like you said, the sound of the bomb or the, um, I wanted the, the feeling, like for example, when he was picked up by the Gestapo and he was taken into this retaining area um, and he said that this guy, you know, um, grabbed him, grabbed him. I said, well, where did he grab you? And he said, well, he, he grabbed me by my shirt. And I said, well, what else did he do? He, he said he took his finger and he pointed, like stuck it right into my throat. And he said, I'm going to kill you. I mean, it's, instead of saying, you know, he was taken by the Gestapo and then he was sent here and he was sent, it's those, those details that are really important to, um, uh, like almost a sensory experience. You learn so much more about the enemy and the victim uh, how he was treated and how the fact that you could feel the breath on his face, well, you know. You, you have to allow, you have to lead them into those areas that maybe they don't think are important to talk about, but that ex explains a whole panoply of experience, as, um, kind of experiential, sensory experiences that just a chronology would not in any way give. It also avoids the cringe-making question of, and how did that make you feel? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah right. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not a good question. Okay, did you want to <laughs> carry on? All right. Well, hang, so, you know, why don't I get Kateri to, yeah, to yeah. I'll introduce you? Okay. okay. Thank you. We're really glad you're here. And I'm, I, I apologize. I didn't even get a chance to ask you if I'm pronouncing your name right. Kateri Akwenze Dam. 
or close. close. <laughs> it's it's Cattery Akawensi Dam. Oh, I wasn't close at all. You're very kind. <laughs> I wondered where the emphasis. Well, compared to some of the pronunciations okay. I've heard, it was pretty good. <laughs> Cattery, Cattery, Cattery. Quincy Dam is an Ashnabi writer who has done extensive work with survivors of residential schools. But that's not all, folks. She has a very impressive uh, CV, spoken word artist, and has, has had her work published uh, in anthologies in, in many countries. Um, is also the, um, I gather, the head of, of our own consulting company called Dam Right, which I really like as a name, <laughs> consulting, and does a lot of work with First Nations. Uh, groups and projects. Oh, well, <laughs> I'm not nervous. I'm perfectly calm. I've been in broadcasting for 30 years. Anybody know? <laughs> oh, sweetheart, give me a rewrite. <laughs> All right. Sorry. Sorry about that. Okay. So, where we, everybody, Kateri, was just um, um, sort of going through a first round of, of, of uh, recounting um, experiences as interviewers and encounter, so, uh, so relating in a, an encounter with one of your subjects, which kind of illustrates some of the challenges um, and, and things to be mindful for in, in doing this kind of work. So if you're, if you're uh, ready to pick it up from there, that'd be great. Sure. Hi, everyone. And uh, I apologize for being a little bit late. Um, I feel like a bit of uh, someone fresh off the res because I get in downtown Toronto and immediately get lost. But anyway, uh, sorry for that. Um, yeah, I actually was thinking about this a lot, and, and there are kind of two fairly recent experiences I've had that sort of are almost at the opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, I, I'm, um, I've been involved with uh, the Aboriginal Healing Foundation for quite a while, um, so I've been doing interviews with residential school survivors, and, and one of the main ones I did resulted in um, a piece for um, one of the Aboriginal Healing Foundation's books which is called From Truth to Reconciliation. Um, it's available, I think it's still available, even though the Healing Foundation is winding down for free online. So if you want to take a look at it, it it's available there. Um, and it was an interview with Garnet Anjikanev, uh, an Anishinaabe um, journalist who is a residential school survivor. Um, Garnet, by the time I interviewed him, which I think was in about 2007, um, was already on the board of the Aboriginal Healing Foundation. He was involved with various uh, support groups for people who had were residential school survivors or um, also people who were affected by intergenerational trauma caused by uh, residential school abuse. So um, he divulged his, his abuse at residential school. Uh, I think about 10 years prior to that, he'd been involved in a in a lawsuit against uh, the, uh, the perpetrator of, of his abuse, and uh, this fellow had abused many other uh, young boys, both at the residential school he was at and elsewhere subsequently. Um, so when I interviewed Garnet, it was, it was an amazing experience. Um, he had already written and talked about his abuse. I was able to uh, spend several days with him, which is unusual. Um, but I had that luxury, so I, I spent a lot of time and just talked with him, got to know him, and he was very um, forthcoming. And uh, so really I just had to kind of um, uh, know when to kind of guide things for information that I knew that I would need, and when to just be quiet and listen and, and let him tell his story the way that he wanted to tell it. So. Um, I came away from that just feeling so inspired and uh, and moved by by the, his story as well as by him as a person because I've been able to develop a relationship with him over days of talking to him and also from the research I've done reading his own words and so on. Um, so that was that was kind of one end. And then recently um, I'm working on a book about the Aboriginal Family Foundation with uh, with Wayne Spear, who's a Mohawk writer. And as part of that, I, I wanted to find out more about the actual programs because I've never had the opportunity to actually visit many of the, the programs that are funded by the Aboriginal Healing Foundation. So, <clears throat> um, and I also was very interested in the Inuit experience because it's, it's quite different in many ways from what happened in the South with First Nations. So I decided to go um, to Rankin Inlet and visit with people there and talk to 
um, a, a group of people who worked in some of the smaller communities and they were flying into Rankin Inlet at that time for a meeting. So I prearranged everything to, uh, to go there and to talk with this group about the book and just to find out what they were doing in their programs, what sort of um, experiences they had in running these programs. And uh, I had spoken at length with somebody who was organizing the meeting and um, was sort of a coordinator. And then I, I got there a little bit early and I was waiting in the hall and they called me in. And I thought, okay, this is a bit weird because I'm kind of walking into their meeting. And so I sat there and um, so of course, then they didn't want to carry on with their meeting. <laughs> they wanted me to tell them what I was doing there. Um, so everything, right then, a kind of alarm bell went off for me, but anyway, um, the person who was supposed to have told them what I was doing and introduce what I was doing um, said something really brief. I don't know if he'd said anything earlier, and then the floor was mine, and so I was trying to explain to them that what the book project was, um, what the subject matter was. Um, before I really could get very far, they started asking me questions about it. Um, so suddenly I was on the hot seat kind of being interviewed by them. Um, I was trying to kind of ease them into answering some of the questions that I had about their programs. And, um, and some of the people in the room started divulging their own experience in residential school, uh, some of the impacts on their families and communities. Uh, there were tears. And I was thinking, OK, this is not even what the book is about. Um, but I, I was respectfully listening. I was taking down some notes for some things that kind of intersected with what I was doing. And um, <clears throat> I'm thinking, OK, now how can I bring this back on track? Because um, while I appreciate that they want to tell their stories, I also don't want people divulging all sorts of things and then having expectations that I'm going to be writing a book about it or something. So I, I tried to say something to them. and. Um, and uh, it wasn't received very well. I, I think I'm a pretty sensitive and tactful person, but um, as soon as I said, you know, the, the, uh, the top, what the topic of the book was again, just to remind them and to say, you know, um, thank you for that. I'm really interested in now your experience working in the programs. And they said, uh, one of the people kind of piped up and he said, well, don't you think that the survivor's experience is important? And I said, well, of course I do. It's very important. Um, and, and while that is, in some ways, part of the subject of the book, really what the book is about is the Aboriginal Healing Foundation and that moment in history and what led to it and, and so on. And uh, uh, he said, oh, OK. Well, we've given you enough time, so bye. <laughs> so I was immediately dismissed from the room. <laughs> so I walked out in kind of in a daze after like about 10 minutes of being in the room with them. Um, and a lot happened, obviously, in that 10 minutes, tears and um, people telling me about their abuse at residential school and so on. So um, that was a big learning experience for me as well, because uh, here I had an experience with somebody who was very much ready to tell his story, very accustomed to telling his story. And then I was in a group of people um, who hadn't had those same opportunities. From flying communities in Nunavut, um, the Inuit have a different experience. Um, people had been starting to tell me that Inuit are about 10 years behind in terms of dealing with residential school abuse and, and the survivors are just not really at the same place yet. And um, so I got um, that message loud and clear during that meeting. So um, I had to kind of fight an impulse to say, but, you know, and, and try to, you know, um, stay in the room. And, uh, and to, you know, to me, I just realized, um, you know, I just have to be respectful. The story that I want is not the story that they want to tell right now. And unfortunately, I can't do anything with the story that they want to tell. It's not fair to take up their time and talk to them about something that I can't do anything with. So, um, so I just kind of left it at that. I did run into them later at a community event that I was invited to and uh, chatted with them and they were fine and I was fine with them. Um, but it just wasn't the right moment um, for either of us to be in that room together. Um, so that, that was kind of a, 
a hard lesson um, that made me really think about, you know, um, you know, what, what's my role here? What am I trying to do and what's important? And really I had to realize that, um, that me wanting to do research was not as important as, as uh, res being respectful of, of where they were in terms of their, uh, their trauma and their experience at residential school. And so I had to basically, after flying all the way to Rankin Inlet, um, just walk away from it and uh, use the little bits that I got uh, that were useful. But uh, yeah, that was um, that was a that was a very interesting experience and very much different than what happened when I spoke with Garnet. Sort of the two ends of, of the spectrum in terms of people being ready and knowing. I think it also points out another uh, important issue, which is to be clear with people you're dealing with that what, what you're expecting, that the contract sort of, it, the, that kind of contract happens up front so those surprises don't happen. Yes, yeah, I, I thought I had done all that prep, um, but um, because I was working through another person, right. uh, when I got in the room, it felt um, like maybe they hadn't been prepped in the way that I had um, asked and expected, and so, uh, yeah, once the question started flying at me, I knew I was in trouble. <laughs> Maybe we can get back to um, issues around that, because Ted also mentioned, you know, he this was through people in the town that knew other people, how one gets access, how one builds a relationship. But we're very fortunate to have Andrea Litwack with us tonight, who comes at interviewing survivors from a different place, obviously, as, as part of a therapeutic experience, which isn't necessarily our purpose, although that often is what happens. So Andrea, listening to what you uh, have heard here, um, what do you, what do we, are the things that we need to think about, this, about the state of mind of our subjects? And when you listen to this, what are the cautions? What, is it, what does it tell you? Well, listening to what you have to say today. I think that's on. Say a little yeah, yeah, closer. Okay. Okay. all right, all right. As I've been preparing also to teach interviewing to journalism founders at the Monk School in Catholic, they can't, you can't That's you've got to really hold it, you've got to really hold it right in your face. All right. As I've been preparing to teach interviewing at the Monk School, I began to realize that there's inherent ethical dilemmas um, that I think journalists face, at least from my social work perspective. And the importance of telling the story and informing the public versus the potential impact of the, on the persons or the persons involved. And today you heard a lot about um, interviewing people with uh, past traumas. As Esther said, you're also going to be faced potentially with uh, interviewing people right after an event. Now, at times, it is apparent that it's in the public's best interest to be fully informed. I think as journalists, you, 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 you know, you hold to that. And we can, we can say that future disasters may be avoided or handled differently if we have the knowledge. Um, s simply, we've had in the media sexual assaults. Well, maybe if we know the details of how and when and where, this could be avoided and pain could be spared in the future. However, this telling might not always be in the best interest of the victim. Uh, best interest of the victim. This is so, no matter the type of trauma, and whether it's a single incident of sexual assault, ongoing abuse that occurred in a residential school, or even the atrocities that uh, we talk about today, the Holocaust, the genocide in Rwanda, I see the book about Afghanistan, uh, near me I was just came back from a conference in the States, and um, uh, trauma around war is huge in the mental health but, um, and these stories have to be told, but we must always be cognizant that there's a person behind the story and that there is responsibility to ensure that we not, do not further oppress the oppressed. Um, the main thing to remember when you are interviewing victims of trauma is that they are all vulnerable in one way or the other and there are as many different responses and. and, and types of trauma and so forth as people in this room times a hundred. However, what they've all shared is the experience of being helpless, the experience of intense fear, and the experience of lack of power. It is essential that you as journalists recognize this 
and give each person as much control as possible in terms of answering or not answering questions. And I believe, I don't remember who, but a number of the, this is not a great mic. And I don't remember who, but an, uh, at least one of you referred to that. Um, really going where we call it in social work, going where the client is, or staying where the client is, and this is really where the interviewee is. Coercion, even subtle coercion, and it's easily to it's easy to move to subtle uh, coercion, is not, in my view, as a mental health professional, acceptable because there's always potential that you're going to dam further damage the person, and don't kid yourself, that potential is there. It's an error to assume that because a person appears unscathed, that they are unscathed. We've all seen scenes of people emerging from the Twin Towers in, uh, you know, on September 11th. Some people looked not too bad. They didn't have physical injuries. Some of them appeared calm. Don't fool yourself. These people have been changed forever, and often they're much more affected than it initially appears. So if you're sticking a microphone in somebody's face in a situation like that, you better remember that there's a human being there and a very vulnerable human being. Now, spilling out details of a traumatic event may activate a person and overwhelm them with intense feelings. This is not good. In a clinical situation, when I've interviewed lots of uh, uh, victims of trauma, when I see that happening, I pull back, I contain, okay? It might make for compelling television, but it is not, uh, it is not uh, responsible in terms of dealing with another human being. Um, it's your responsibility, in my view, to make every attempt not to further trigger the person, but rather to contain them. And, um, uh, you know, in a way, that's what I heard happening with the, um, the, your last incident with the residential school, that you recognize by opening up these stories and not doing anything with them, that it was not uh, a very ethical way to go. Um, so that's really, part, that's really part of it. Now, going back to a person's response to trauma, this is very individual. And how a person responds to trauma depends on their personal history and their uh, uh, background, their experience of poverty, with racism, with social marginalization, the severity of the trauma, let's face it, not all traumas are created equal, and the post-event uh, supports of the trauma. So if you interview a person immediately following trauma, remember that you are dealing with, again, I don't mean to belabor the point, but I will, a very vulner vulnerable person. Don't overwhelm them, know when to back off, listen. Um, you've all heard the term PTSD. I'm not going to go into that now. If anyone wants to know more about it, I will, I will certainly be happy to talk about it. Um, but um, know that PTSD is, uh, is a medical term, post-traumatic stress disorder, which is often seen in uh, victims of trauma a month after the effect to ongoing, and um, uh, these people have a lot of symptoms that we want to be aware of when we're interviewing them. For example, going back to the Holocaust, it's not uncommon now for elderly Holocaust survivors to really um, get triggered by a shower in an in a institution because it brings back the gas chambers, and people working with elderly Holocaust survivors are cognizant of that. So when you're interviewing somebody, be aware that these innocuous stimuli can really bring back awful pieces. Um, I guess what I want to say is that in order to ethically interview a person after a traumatic experience, the key is to approach the individual carefully and respectfully. And I believe that term has been used before. I think Esther mentioned that. Do not say, I know how you feel or I understand, because believe me, you no. don't. You don't. And um, identify yourself, start with a soft, gentle question. If you have time to try to develop a relationship, that's great. Most important, ensure that the person has control throughout the interview. 
and pace the interview in a, ma a manner that allows them to feel empowered. If a person is showing any signs of agitation, pull back. If they want to stop, stop. You can always find other ways to get the story, but like Humpty Dumpty, you can't put that person back together again. Thank you, Andrew. Ted, do you generally um, do interviews over a course of time? Do you uh, do you ever just approach people without your notepad? I mean, how do you how do you build how do you get that access? How do you build that trust? Uh, I think Carol Lynn hit it on the head a moment ago when she saw, talked about research. To a certain extent, being fully and I don't think I have to belabor that point. The better your knowledge of the subject area you're walking into and the person, if you have access to their experience, the more comfortable they are with you or he or she is with you because he or she will understand, you understand some of the, some of the ground. I can't understand the Holocaust, I wasn't there, but I know if I've researched it, I have a, a handle on it. Um, when that young man came to my house, I wanted to make sure he felt comfortable. We sat at the kitchen table, um, and I recognized his fear. Uh, I had a lot of questions. I was trying to find the ones that he didn't have the answers for. Um, but in a way, with all due respect, I disagree a little bit on the, on the notion that when you find the button that's going to reveal the material that you should hold back. It's our instinct to go for that button. It's our sense that the better story is the deeper, closer to the heart story. I don't think any of us wants to damage that person in any way. We have a great deal of respect for someone who's gone through a traumatic event. We respect their dignity and their humanity and so on. When I, because Brian had been at the location where the four young men had been killed. He had seen it. He knew what uh, they looked like. I didn't ask him that. But when we got to his description, that's when he asked me to turn the tape recorder off. And I said, that's fine. I don't have a problem with it. What I didn't say to him is I had the medical records. I know exactly what happened to them from the medic who was there. So you begin to earn that person's respect by giving them that ground and that space. Another interview I did with a Korean War veteran, because I thought of it as you described, their breaking down in the middle of an interview. It was a, it was a man who had gone into a minefield to retrieve Canadians who had inadvertently gone into a friendly minefield and set off the mines and two of them were dead and four of them wounded. And this guy went in with two of his platoon mates to retrieve them because they knew where the mines were. And in the middle of the story, we were sitting at a picnic table in Elmont, Ontario. We were sitting at a picnic table and he fell apart. And I thought it was because I was bringing back all those horrific images to his mind and his, from his memory because it was 50 years previous. And I stopped. I gave him time and space. I didn't say anything. Silence is a good friend. Silence is a really good friend. Use it. Because they feel they then have to say something sometimes, even if it's not for broadcast. And I, and I assumed it was the horrific pictures that I was triggering in his mind. And I said words to this effect, it must have been a horrible night. He said, it was the darkest night of my life, but that's not why I was crying, he said. And I said, why? I thought, I triggered the memories. No, nope, I made the wrong assumption. He told me that the reason he was weeping was that he had not seen the two men with whom he had shared that experience since the very night it happened. And I realized in that moment I jumped to the wrong conclusion. And giving him that space, but then pursuing it too, he told me that he hadn't had the chance to debrief, to have the closure and all those words that we attached to it, and he had that chance eventually. And I got the right story, not the wrong one having maybe used some of those tools and those, those opportunities. Can I respond to that? Yeah. I think, Ted, you're doing exactly what I'm trying to say, that, that, that it's good interviewing. You, you're not, you weren't hitting him on the head with it. 
Obviously, you're not going to get a good story if you come up with a list of who, why, what, where, and when, and stay away from any feeling. That's not going to be, no one's going to want to read the story. But the way you describe how you manage those difficult situations, you pulled back when you had to, you, you silenced when you had to, you gave the people control, and that's really what I'm talking about. Can I just say one thing? Um, I don't think we addressed, actually, um, uh, the technical and physical aspect of this, in the sense that I think the most, one of the most important aspects in doing an interview with someone, anybody, is having major eye contact. You shouldn't be sitting there with your questions on your uh, lap and looking down and reading the questions of you. It, it, it'll never work. I mean, you wouldn't do this with your best friend. You have a, I think I kind of look at it as a kind of a musical composition in a strange kind of way. There's a certain ebb and flow to it. Uh, um, there are codas, there are high notes, there are low notes, and you can, you know, you, it's almost like contrapuntal, and you can kind of do it together. But it's really important to, to first find the, the, the spatial comfort level with the person you're addressing or interviewing. Um, some people like, it depends on your mic as well. Uh, you know, if you're just taking notes, that's, that perhaps is easier. But if you have a, a microphone or a tape recorder or whatever, um, you decide where you're going to, first of all, check your batteries. That's number one. You don't want anything going wrong in the middle of the story. I mean, that's the worst. It shows complete lack of professionalism, and it destroys it. Trust me, it happened to me once. So um, um, find, you know, make sure that, that you and your, the person you're interviewing are comfortably seated somewhere, you know have to sit off, I mean, you make that decision and how far that you feel that person's comfortable with you, where you're gonna put your microphone, I mean, you, 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 it's kind of a period of adjustment in the beginning, and then when you, you find that comfort and that rhythm, and you, you just, you can tell everything by someone's uh, eyes and their body language, you can almost, not always, but often anticipate what they're going to say, and never jump in when they're talking. Never let them let them finish. Make a mental note of something they said. You want to come back to it. Um, occasionally, you might like that time when he was telling me about um, uh, you know, where the guy grabbed him. I kind of quickly, but but. Um, if it's a very emotional thing, do not interrupt it at any rate. And this has nothing to do with the victim at all, but I will say this, that um, I kind of learned my lesson about that. Well, not I didn't learn a lesson, I, well, I guess I did. Um, I interviewed many, many years ago in the 70s. Um, uh, he wasn't served then, but Anthony Hopkins. And Anthony Hopkins um, has this particular way of speaking like he'll talk blah, 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 and then he'll kind of just sit there and you think he's finished, <laughs> but he's not finished. He's kind of gearing up for the, his next thought. And if you break that, you have to kind of learn the rhythm of the person you're talking to. And, and then you can get so much more, and eye contact is, well, I can't emphasize how important it is. And you know what, I hate to say it, occasionally, I do touch somebody, you make up your mind if you want to or you're not, if you don't want to, and they'll let you know immediately if it's offensive or comfortable to them, and that's all I have to say about that. Okay. Um, yeah, I did want to add something there, because I think a lot of this kind of um, body language and so on when you're interviewing someone has a cultural basis. Mm -hmm. So when you're interviewing uh, Indigenous people, especially I know Anishinaabe people and most First Nations people that I know in Canada, um, you don't look them in the eye. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's really like in intimidating. Um, it's not the way we communicate with each other. Um, so that's really aggressive um, oh, that's kind of language, like body language. Yeah, 
So I think well, um, that's in your research too. That's research. To know you won't find you. You probably well, won't but find that. But you'll find out very quickly. You, well, how did you learn that then? Well, I'm an anatomy for one thing. Right, right. <laughs> I'm from the culture, so no, I but I mean it personally. But people have to learn. Uh, if you can't research, and if you go to, if you go to, okay, this is a good question. I suppose <laughs> how uh, it's been my experience looking in a person's eye is very helpful. In your situation that you, how if you haven't researched, how would you know? So when you go for your first interview, say with with um, uh, an individual of that ilk, so how would you deal with them? Well, that's why I'm raising it because I think it, it, I think it's really difficult. Um, it's not like there there's a handbook or you're gonna fo like do some research online or something and you're gonna see something that says oh native people don't like you to look them in the eye. Kind of thing. Um, uh, yeah, I'm telling you, but I mean you you ordinarily you wouldn't find that, but I think there are lots of things like that. Um, when you talked about Anthony Hopkins, um, Indigenous people also tend to have a very slow pace um, and silence to us has different kinds of meanings there's as much meaning in silences as there are in speech um, so you have to learn how to Let's read it and listen absolutely. to it and um, I know uh, uh, Patricia Grace is a Maori writer from uh, Aotearoa from New Zealand who I know very well and she told me one time that she did this interview with somebody and the the uh, the reporter was talking to her about her writing, etc., and she said, I never got to finish my answer to one single question. And I know Patricia, she's very thoughtful and she takes long pauses when she's answering. So exactly the same kind of thing. She has kind of a rhythm to her way of speaking and a lot of uh, Indigenous people do that. Um, we're not afraid of silence, so if, if you pause, like, you, you know, silence sometimes can be your friend and people will, will will speak to fill it, but Indigenous people not necessarily because we don't, we're not afraid of silence, so we could sit there for ages in silence with each other, and it's totally cool, and we can learn a lot about each other. So that I think we have to remember that there's cultural differences that come in when you're interviewing people from other cultures, and so you really need to do your homework, and you may need to just like hang out with some people, um, you know, some of it is just going to be experience and learning and getting to know the communities that you're working within and, um, you know, and also coming to things like this where you get the benefit of talking to, you know, diverse um, group of experienced people who can give you some of those pointers, etc. But um, I think we can't make too many assumptions in terms of like body language and so on because it's not really, um, it's not the same for, for everybody. What, what things mean so no, culturally there can be differences yeah. but what I said about body language I just meant you you can take your cue from if, if, if a person is uh, open they'll show it and if they're not they won't so uh, you're not going to force an openness if it's not naturally there is what I, meant. I, ju I just want to I think this issue of uh, diversity is really 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 important in fact it's a question on a uh, assignment that I give to my students. So <laughs> it's exactly this comes up and, and the reality is that uh, if you're going to be a good interviewer, uh, you're going to have to try to be with the person who you're interviewing and to try to read them. You're never going to learn about every single diversity, whether it's uh, cultural diversity, age diversity. I mean, there's so many, uh, yeah, there's no way. But if you really stay with the person, if you get off that script that you might have in your head, they will give you enough cues so you will know whether to back off, whether to listen, whether to slow down. So um, they're really your teachers. And I would add that, um, and to reinforce what Kateri was saying, is that um, if you are going into a situation where it's a culture that you're not familiar with, if you're not an overseas assignment, for instance, that you spend the time, or you find the ambassador, you know, sort of the anthropological man, and then, too, you have to be sure that whoever it is is authentic to that group. I mean, it's all, it's all a, a, a bit of a landmine. Um, but but at least you make the effort to understand or have someone interpret for you the cultural context, and the time it takes to do that is is going to pay off big time in terms of being able to evaluate what you get and 
also to get more of it. So this is fascinating, but time is running on here. So I'm going to uh, change tacks a little bit because something, uh, especially my work with the forum, is very near and dear to me. And someone who has supervised reporters and, and my, my own work been in some very traumatic situations. And I uh, ask each of you to share. Um, and Andrew would be included in this too, although maybe you have kind of some professional armor that we don't have. What's the impact to you as the teller of these tales? You, you, you know, we, we alluded to post-traumatic stress disorder. Can you can you suffer from it just if you spend a lot of time dealing with victims or in violent situations, traumatic situations? Can I just can, can I just say you can? And there's uh, labels for it: secondary trauma or vicarious trauma. It's well known in the literature. So I don't know who wants to answer this. Yes. I was asked that for the first time maybe four or five years ago and didn't expect it. And I wondered whether I was showing some strange, you know, deviant behavior or something. That, you know, somebody knew me and thought I'd changed. I've interviewed probably 5,000 veterans over the 40 years I've been doing this. And um, to a certain extent, you build up uh, an understanding of where we, these people are going with the stories and a certain numbness to you know, the, you, you feel. Um, I think the, the, the tips that would be valuable for people getting into this area of journalism are that, again, the more you know about where you're going, the better you're going to be prepared. Um, come back to Earth after you've had a chance to talk to these people because I remember bringing Jeff Elwand into one of our uh, classrooms after he'd covered the Bernardo trials. And I, I asked him in front of students, you know, what did you do after having witnessed this day after day after day? He said, I went home and made sure that I hugged my kids and that I connected with the world that was my life away from the court. Ground yourself to a certain extent with the things you're familiar with and, and don't be afraid to ask somebody you love, someone who's close to you, have I changed? Am I doing anything differently? Because maybe you are aware of it, taking, absorbing too much of it and it's, it's having an effect on your personality, your activity and the way you respond to people. Sometimes you get more impatient if you're waiting for answers a lot. No, you tend, I want it, I want it, bring, bring on the, and if you're responding that way to the people who are close to you in your, your life, then, then you've changed, and it is affecting you, and you're becoming impatient. I know that young man I mentioned who was the son of the chief, fire chief in Oxbridge, who witnessed the same event. He said he came back totally changed. He had been, he was impatient with people, he broke up with his wife, he almost left law school and the army because he was so disoriented by it all. But somebody helped him get back on track and he got back into the military, went on to law school, graduated. He's now with the judge advocate uh, group in Ottawa, very grounded. He was with me last spring when we went to Vimy and still suffering from post-traumatic stress. He admitted it. He's drinking more than he ever did before. He recognizes the problem and he readily turns to friends and says, you know, let me know when I'm out of, out of line. So I suspect that that's a long way of saying, be grounded. Um, um, really, I haven't had that much experience interviewing um, the, uh, victims of these you know, traumatic experiences. So. Um, I just know it affected me deeply, and um, um, but um, I think if you're an, an empathic, um, compassionate, and, um, um, and strangely curious person, these things will affect you, and that's I think why you're going to go into the business <laughs> because you care about the people you're interviewing, you care to help tell their story. And um, people who care are affected. But you know, um, like Ted said, you know, you're, if you're grounded and uh, you know you're not the person who went through it, you can recover 
I, I well, I think I, I can't speak for uh, you. Probably know much more about this. Well, I, I, I think the reality is, if you're doing uh, effective inter interviews, you're probably empathically engaging with the people who you're interviewing. If you're empathically engaging with people who've been traumatized, it is going to have some type of effect on you, usually. And um, much as what Ted described, as I said before, there's a label for it, there's secondary uh, trauma, there's vicarious trauma, and yes, the symptoms are not that different from PTSD. Now, I've interviewed a lot of, uh, 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 I worked in sexual assault for a while, familiar with Bernardo and, and his, uh, that's the time uh, to, that I was working in the field. It impacted me, it impacted me, uh, it, it changed my worldview. I don't walk down the street ever in the last 20 odd years in the same way as I did before. I don't go down stairwells in the same way I did before. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but it, 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 it helps you realize that maybe the world is not quite as safe as you thought it was. Um, yeah, a couple things I guess I would add is, um, <clears throat> for me, um, I'm always affected in the sense that, um, while at times I, I feel a great sense of injustice when I hear these stories, when you hear residential school, stories of abuse and so on, it, it can be overwhelming and um, and uh, for me it just sometimes I just feel enraged and this tremendous sense of injustice and, and then I guess what it comes back to for me because I tend to be an action oriented person is well what can I do about it and then I realize well the best thing I can do is the thing that I do best which is tell the stories so I'm doing what I ought to be doing and so it helps me to kind of come to terms with that and, and kind of um, deal with it in positive ways for myself and for the other person. And the other, I guess the other thing that helps me out too is that um, I try not to see people as victims. I see them as people. They're whole people who experienced trauma, who experienced these horrific uh, kinds of, of things in, in their lives. Um, but I see whole people and I think that's because I come from a community uh, where you know there's oppression and, and racial discrimination and all sorts of things happening constantly and so I, I see people dealing with these things on a daily basis almost and um, you know and then I see them with their kids and I see them laughing and I see people teasing each other under the worst possible circumstances where other people would think oh my god what's wrong with them like how can they how can they tease how can they tease somebody who's just had a mental breakdown or something like that? But we do, and that's the truth, that's the reality. Um, because we see that person as a whole person and we wanna laugh with them and we wanna cry with them and so on. So I, for me, that's something that really helps me is that I, I don't see somebody as a victim, I see somebody who's been maybe victimized by something or experienced something, but it's, it, it's a different way of seeing people, I think. Okay, there's one more question I want to just quickly ask, and maybe one of you can answer, if any of you feel comfortable doing so, and then we're going to throw this open and, and let you ask questions to uh, the panel. Ask her the mic. Yes, the mic. <laughs> the mic. I, I'm used to having a big voice, but it's not big enough for this room. So, something else that I was thinking about in terms of the craft, now we're still doing this as some more than others in, in the context of journalism, where truth, for whatever that means, um, or at least, you know, truth telling to the best of our ability is important. So, is there ever, how do you handle the delicacy of, of fact checking when someone's just spilled their guts to you in, in the context where that's, you know, their reality and their truth may be all that you need, but in the context of an ongoing news story, there does need to be some fact checking, at least some reality checking. How, how do you deal with that? <laughs> well, as difficult as it might seem to, to go into a military context and get fact, the fact is that it's there somewhere and it has, it has been recorded, the context of it. And I have a lot of colleagues, historians, to whom I can go and say, did this happen where this particular incident? 
are you aware of this particular incident? Does, does this connect? Um, the military loves detail. If you can find it, it will give you the context. The other thing that I find is a natural fact-checking device. And it, it sometimes makes for an unruly interview, but it very often works, at least in the work that I've done, is to interview two people at once. Two veterans in this case. Why? Because a story that might get embellished by one man or woman doesn't when there are two of them there. Mm. They keep each other honest, mm. to a certain extent. The other thing that happens is they help each other because they've both been there. Some one of them is moving along through a story and then there's a gap. The other one automatically feels, oh, I know that the word you're looking for, or the picture or the date or whether it was what the weather was, they, that other person helps out. I've been in interviews where I've got six or eight of them and it's bizarre because it just goes all over the place. That's crazy, but I had no choice. I was interviewing D-Day veterans and a bunch of them got together in the basement of a, of a friend in Halifax, and it was chaos, but a lot of it later was valuable. But that I found helpful in talking to or listening to two people and guiding the interview back and forth. One gets a chance to catch his breath while the other one's talking, and then they're listening to each other, they bounce, and they all always trigger each other's memories. Mm -hmm. Oh, that reminds me of the time when, and oh, oh yeah, right, and away they go. Now, checking those details, sometimes difficult. One of the most um, rewarding moments in interviewing veterans I ever had was being able to reunite uh, two D-Day veterans, one who was flying the tug aircraft of a glider, and the other man who was actually the pilot in the glider that the man was tugging. And of course, over Normandy, the line is cut, and away went the glider, and the other guy did a pass and hit it back. Their stories were not uh, in completely in step, but they were able to corroborate all the details. One of them was from Vancouver, one was from Port Hope. I brought them together, and all the details just were in perfect step with each other all the way down the line. It was great. You don't run into that very often. Well, they had two <laughs> witnesses of the specific moments of D-Day, and it was, you know, the stars aligned. For me, it was perfect. Yeah. Alright, just some fun answer because it's not mine. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I don't have a lot to say to this one. I think so much depends on what sort of story you're doing and, and what the intent of it is and so on, whether it matters or not. Um, one of the things that I do is take notes and so if somebody says, you know, oh, when I was 11 or 12 or maybe I was 16 or whatever, then I try to note that, go back to it and say, so you were, you know, 12 when that happened or that was 1975 or whatever. See if they can confirm it because sometimes if in the telling of the story, they just want to tell the story, and they're not as concerned. But if you go back to it, then they'll say, okay, well, just a minute. Well, let's see, my brother was doing such and such, and we lived in such and such a house, and I know that, okay, so it was definitely 1973 or whatever. Um, so that's one thing you can do, is once you kind of get the story from them, you can go back and, and kind of um, check the facts, but. Well, um, can I just say, well, um, okay. in, in the memoir situation, um, I spent, um, I don't know, how, I had about seven hours of interview, and then I had to transcribe it from the tape recorder. Um, and I will say this is, this is difficult because um, the man um, I interviewed, um, he, was, uh, he had a very uh, heavy Czechoslovakian accent, and I was trying to transcribe from a tape recorder. Um, and it was pretty tough because I, you know, I, I didn't understand everything. So basically, I did the best I could. I brought the entire manuscript back to him and we worked through it together. And sometimes working through it, and I brought my tape recorder with me, and sometimes um, uh, he, he would give me a further interview to elucidate a particular area that was kind of grayish and I wanted more color, and, and you know, so we, we worked together, it was his story. I was just the, the what would you call? Conduit. The conduit. But um, it, was, it was 
it was very interesting to see how he reacted to seeing his story in print. And it was, um, well, it was very special. But, but that's, we, we fact checked by, in that case, and a lot of journalists don't have an opportunity when they're putting something you know, to bed that night or whatever. But I did have that opportunity, and I think it was, very, it was a very good experience for um, the gentleman as well. But that, that was very helpful in being able to, to, go, back. to go back and, uh, and clarify so many things. It's very helpful. So we seem to have a portable mic element. I don't know if you want to. Yeah. Yeah. So questions. Questions. Gentleman here. Um. All right. Uh, sorry, never been on mic before. So. <laughs> uh, my question for you guys is: uh, I, the way I view it, I kind of see journalists kind of like detectives, if you will, um, in the sense that you know when police or detectives need to go to a scene and it's a very traumatic scene, that they have to be, as you said, <coughs> respectful and um, compassionate as well, but still keep that professional. Does an attack? Um, would you agree that that would be an accurate way to view the job as a journalist? Is it similar in that regard to detectives handling a situation? Is, would that be a, like a fair assessment of uh, the role of journalists in that in that case? Panels. <laughs> to be. Well, go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. You're you're asking whether we should whether we should be as professional as police officers in that situation. Um, yes and no. I guess yeah. Keep the professionalism, but also, as my question is more, is it uh, are the roles similar? Sorry. So they it, it, still have to be professional, yet at the same time they need to be compassionate of the people who went through the traumas. Whereas journalists, you you have the same sort of. Um, responsibility to get a story out, but as well, you need to be respectful and professional. Yeah, I think, I, I think any, any police officer who is a, is a, any police officer who's good at her or his job is going to be professional and, and understanding of the, of the, say, the situation where there's, there are victims and witnesses and, um, I don't think I'm telling tales out of school, but my son-in-law is a police officer with the Toronto Police Service, and he went to the one of the events that happened in East York not so long ago, where um, a man had he had attacked uh, some people. I think he, he had some knives, and the police officers, in order to protect other civilians, uh, shot the man. And my son-in-law works with the canine unit arrived on the scene and everyone was standing there, nobody moving. And what he did was he very calmly said to his fellow police officers, okay everybody, you know what to do, let's get at it. And all of the police officers had been standing, the civilians had been standing, began to move the civilians away and the police in to do their work. But it was funny how it required that that person to say, let's do our jobs folks. And he was he's not even a sergeant. But and more to the point, I think if you're asking about how you get the information, I'm guessing in some way, and it's basically based on reading detective fiction more than ever having covered the cop beat. But um, I'm 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 guessing that police ask questions at the scene differently than when they're doing the next round of the investigation, because they also um, recognize that uh, that the victims are traumatized. And you know, notoriously, eyewitness accounts are completely, you know, they're, they're usually thrown out of court, they're never used. So they will also probably calibrate what they ask and how they ask it the same way you might, right? So it's the kind of thing, if you're doing breaking news, the kind of thing, the way you approach it, the questions you'll ask, is very different than if you're going back months later to get a bigger and fuller story. So in that way, I guess there probably is some similarity. Sometimes the professionalism in a moment like that is just listening watching, listening, taking down whatever, what you see, because you might forget 24 hours later what color clothing they were wearing or where they were standing. That, the police do that too. So listening and watching are sometimes the best skills of all and not speaking at all initially. Um, 
Hi guys. Um, a lot of good tips coming out of you guys today, a lot of good advice, but I feel like a lot of them could be applied to good interview skills in general. So any interview that you're doing, you should follow most of the advice you give. And I'm just wondering if there's anything you could think of that's specific, that's different when interviewing survivors as opposed to interviewing Rob Ford or anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> be still my time. I can try to answer that. Um, you're right. This is a good, basic good interview. And I think that uh, uh, it, it's not something that we can cover in 10 minutes, 15 minutes. It's basically, you know, it's, it's hours and hours of uh, work and discussion and learning. I think if you follow some of the key pieces that what was uh, people discussed today, including some of the pieces that I said around containment, around pacing, around stepping back when you have to. And, and um, uh, Ted gave some wonderful examples of that. That is what I would say would be different. And maybe being uh, highly attuned and highly sensitive to your, uh, the person you're interviewing, maybe more so than you normally would be. Sorry. I was just going to chime in because this is a teachable moment. Um, having interviewed Holocaust survivors, war victims, veterans, um, being a PTSD survivor myself because I was in trauma situations and so I've been affected by it. I have a lot of experience, but the basic thing, the difference between interviewing non-media savvy coached people and Rob Ford. <laughs> no, no, it's, is that there's different rules. Yes. You do not have to clean up quotes. You do not have to make Rob Ford sound nice. You do not, like with Jean Chrétien and with some of the politicians and athletes, what they say gets put on verbatim and let the chips fall where they may because they have been trained. Same thing with uh, CEOs and what have you, athletes who've had media training, stars, Kanye West. You know, when he said, I'm gonna let you finish, that went on, right? So you don't do that, or you can do different approach with victims of trauma survivors because there's different rules, because they haven't been trained. And we do, I don't know if your teachers have taught you that, but anyway, FYI, you can always talk about that afterwards. There's questions on this side, and then I'll come back. Yeah, I, I can speak a little bit to that, because I, I actually have um, had a bit of an evolution in my own thinking around this issue. Uh, I was a journalist for a long time, and now I'm working with a medical aid organization, Doctors Without Borders, and it's in saint Frontier. And the big difference that I've seen uh, in terms of, uh, now I'm observing journalists doing interviews. Uh, often I'm there you know, in Congo or in Haiti after the earthquake and so forth, and I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat the buffer. I'm the fiercely protective communications person who is trying to protect our aid workers who may have been kidnapped in Darfur or uh, trapped in a building or uh, listening to trauma stories all day because they are mental health specialists or certainly are, you know, rape victims uh, in the Congo. And what I see as uh, an egregious blind spot for journalists, and I, I have this myself, is that they, they have an insensitivity to the risk of re-traumatizing mm -hmm. a victim through the retelling. And there's a great, uh, really fascinating book on mental health, I think it was called Crazy Like Us, uh, which has a chapter in it about the tsunami uh, of 2005, around Christmas. There were a lot of mental health specialists from different aid organizations, some of them experienced in the region, most of them not, and a lot of journalists who were asking people what it was like to have that huge wave come over and wipe out their whole communities and their fishing boats and their families and everything. And culturally, I mean, it touches a bit on that cultural issue, it was the worst possible thing you could do to uh, people, you know, in Banda Aceh. And, and, you know, there were very specific cultural ways that people dealt with grief, dealt with trauma. And, uh, you know, our attitude as journalists and even aid organizations, I would say, is that we have a habit of just trampling over all of that because we need the story. We need all the juicy details and you, you kind of blindly go for that because that, that's your job. Or you're a researcher and you know, doing something after a disaster and you think, well, we've got to collect all this data, except that there are other researchers and other journalists and everybody's asking the same people often the same story because once you become the poster child for victimization in a certain 
tragedy, um, everyone knows that you're willing to talk, and they expect that you will. And there is a certain amount of bullying that I've observed, which I find shocking. And, it, and it's, it's just a whole new way of looking at things from, from my perspective now. It's, it's been quite a learning experience. I just want to respond to that, because I think it's so well said. And um, uh, you and I, I don't know, I was making eye contact with you. I don't know if you were with me. But you said it beautifully. There's a real risk of re-traumatizing. And um, I mean, you just give some wonderful examples. Thank you. Can I just pick up one small arrow, a quick point, and, and it would, as a tip for you in response to what we've just been describing, find somebody who hasn't been interviewed before. I know that's opening the wound up for that person, but if they aren't the poster child, the other thing that happens too is if they've been interviewed before, they begin to develop a script the way they will interpret these things, and they feel more and more comfortable with it, and that seems the best way to describe it. Whereas if you're finding someone who's never been interviewed before, it's honest, more honest, it's ad lib, it's coming from the heart. I generally don't interview officers. I interview lower ranks, because they don't have a vested interest in the end story and the way it gets published. Mm -hmm. For them, it's you know, their war was the war that's a few feet in front of them and you decided them not up in the paneled offices of the headquarters. So find people whose experience hasn't been explored before, if that's possible, and you'll find material that's unique and fresh and, and I think, honest. And, and I think, Ted, you raise a really important point there. It's getting off track from the original question, and it's a bit indelicate, perhaps, to raise it. But um, you know, a colleague of mine once ended up telling the story of some survivors, uh, supposed survivors in um, uh, conflict in Bosnia, and it turned out it wasn't true. So again, having the cultural context and some understanding and being a bit suspicious that people are a little over anxious. I mean, again, people respond in many different ways. Some people validate their grief and their pain by talking about it. Other people need a lot of time to process it. But you also, if you were in a situation of, you know, where, where there are things at stake, as you mentioned with the officers, is where is this, you know, you have all your antennae while you're being empathetic and, 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 uh, and, and respectful. All your antennae as a skeptical journalist have to be living somewhere. You just, you know, you obviously put them right at the back at that moment. But again, you have to understand the context of where you are. And if you're being played, uh, which is not really the subject of tonight, but while we're talking about, uh, it, made, it made me think of it as you, as you mentioned that, Ted. There's a question here, and then I'll come back to the other side. Um, I wanted to ask this to Ted, oh, all of you, I guess, but first to Ted, because you were talking about turning off the tape recorder uh, when um, a, a trauma victim just wants you, wants you to, which is something that you would never do if you were if you were interviewing somebody who had been trained to do an interview. Um, I'm wondering, what do you do with that information? The, 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 what do you do with what the person tells you when the tape recorder is off? And what do you think the understanding is that the person has of what you're going to do with the information? They don't advance that I'm writing a book. In this case, Heath Bryan did. Um, it was a bit of a, maybe it was a ploy on my part to make him feel more confident with me. I wasn't doing it for broadcast. And it's a very different world right. when what's being recorded is going to go to air. And unless they say, this is off the record, and you abide by that as best you can, I was doing it to make him feel comfortable, one, to get by the descriptions of the four killed Canadians and also to recognize have him recognize that I respected his wishes as best I could. Um, that information is tremendously valuable if you make, and, this, and somebody s was responding earlier to a question about, I think Carolyn, you were talking about tape recorders and how sometimes they're not over, very reliable and so on. Take notes and record, do both. I recommend that highly in my news reporting classes because inevitably the, the recorder is going to crap out on you and you've got your notes as the backup. But I use the material that was not recorded from the notes to 
ask somebody else about it to corroborate and get the details. So I, I make use of all that information, even if it's off the tape or off record. You say, a source told me such and such. Is it true? So you use the information that was off the record or not taped to get uh, the fact checked somewhere else. Does that answer your question? Well, uh, yes. But I, re I respect that you're saying that broadcasting is a whole other world because you need that stuff. And he did. But I had the information from the medic. I had the medical reports from the incident. That was another reason I turned off the tape recorder. I knew I didn't need what he was fearful of telling me. He was most concerned about offending the family members of the men who were killed by maybe not describing it appropriately. He was more concerned about offending them than of my publishing inaccurate material and Glory material. So, uh, and, I, and I had spoken to the medic as well, and he gave me all the detail and the records I needed to, so that I knew. And I wasn't interested necessarily in that detail. I was interested in response, his response to it, and he gave me. He got back on the chopper that morning, and he was a walking wounded uh, soldier, so he sitting, and across from him were the four empty seats on the chopper going back to Kandahar, and that's when he lost it. And he described that to me quite honestly. He broke down, and I broke down too, because it was a pretty powerful moment. If I can just, I don't want to um, take up too much more time, but what would you do if it was information that you knew that you needed? Would you turn off the tape recorder? Hmm. I once did an interview with a guy who described to me an incident in Korea, which he later told me I couldn't use. I, was, I had recorded it, and he called me later, and he said, that stuff is still top secret. I said, 50 years later? Come on. He insisted that I not use it. And I knew that the book would not live or die because I had that information, so I respected it. And I said, okay, I understand. I won't use it. And I know that's dangerous because it can sometimes take away the strength and the quality of your book. But I also have a damn good reputation among veterans across this country, and I think it's because I listen, and I do have a, a respect for their wishes when it's that important to them. Take it or leave it, I guess. No, I was just thinking of the Dan Rather approach. <laughs> he's ruthless. I mean, he said it. He used whatever he wanted, whatever he wanted, he didn't care. I think, you know, it's an individual, I mean, I think it's very individual. It also depends where you're using it, how you're using it. I mean, there are all these calls you have to make regarding those situations. Happily, I've never had to deal with that, thank God. Um, uh, but, um, you know, he chose his way. Someone else might have used that material. Yeah. Um, actually, I have two questions. I'll time be quick. Um, question number one. Um, I had an initial experience when I interviewed a woman who's the wife of a man who's on death row in Iran. So she has been traumatized by all that. It's been years he's been there. Um, and she insisted that I gave her the questions beforehand, which I've never been asked before. So I did. But I'm curious what you guys would think of that. About giving the questions to them ahead of time. I interview questions to her. She wanted to know beforehand what they would be. Kind of reduces the spontaneity, but she, you know, otherwise it wouldn't have gotten into it. Carol, what would you do? Oh, my God. You answer this. Carol has a social worker. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a. Like, as a social worker, what I said about giving traumatized people control. Right. If she needs that control, I would give it to her. You may not have the most exciting interview, but uh, as a social worker, I, like I said, no coercion. To me, that you go by play by her rules. And, and I'd split the difference. <laughs> <laughs> CBC policy actually is that you don't provide questions yeah, ahead of time. Oh, really? Well, yes. not, never, nothing is ever never. But, 
But in this case, mm -hmm. I think it would be fair to say, here are the five things I'm going to ask you about. Doesn't mean you can't do follow-ups. You know, I wouldn't type out the precise. And again, there's a difference between a politician, a coached professional, an accountant. It's not an accountability interview. Right? In an accountability interview, you're not going to give the questions ahead of time. I don't think it would affect the spontaneity much because it becomes an engagement. So, I, I mean, I think you can split the difference in a situation like that. Give the, give the interviewee the question areas. Yes. I want to talk about this yeah. area of That's your exactly experience. Right. Yeah. I want to talk not generally not. about this. And then zero in on the specifics when you're there. What are they going to say? Stop the tape recorder? You know, I, don't, I didn't expect that specific question. Okay. But anyway, well, um, but I think Esther's absolutely right. She also wanted to have the article before I published it. Like, no. it just, well, that that in fact, it depends who you work for. That will either happen or not happen. There's right. certain, um, you know, different media organizations have different policies around how much of that is negotiable. And I guess it would just be important to know that. But you do raise an important point, which is. The rules of engagement ahead of time to answer your question as well in terms of is it on or off the record as much as that's clear beforehand and I think that's about building the relationship too being really clear about what's what's going to happen and what what the contract is is probably really important to build trust. Yeah, I I probably because I don't work for a news organization or whatever I would probably give the questions and then decide whether or not I'm going to use the interview. I mean, it might be totally boring because she's yeah. coached herself and she's decided what she's is and isn't going to say. And, you know, I would try giving follow-up questions and trying to draw more out of her if I could. But, you know, I think a lot just depends on what you're doing and why you're doing it and whether there's a larger context of, like, with veterans or some group that you want to build trust with them and that you, you want others to know that you're you know, you're a person of your word and so on. So I think there's a lot of factors, but, um, you know, for the kind of interviews that I do, I would probably agree to it, but try to push it. And I also think, though, sometimes, you know, even when you make an agreement, uh, for example, Phil Fontaine, when he divulged his abuse at residential school, he thought he was off the record. Um, and then it came out in papers. But it was such a huge thing, I can understand why um, even though it was supposed to be off the record, it ended up on the record, and you know now he's he has said that in his career, doesn't matter what he did, what agreements he signed, what negotiations he was involved in, um, other major events that he was involved in, he's known as the guy that you know divulged residential school abuse. Mm -hmm. um, but I think he was with it, and he acknowledges it. Okay, so we're going to take two more questions. Oh, okay. And then um, I hope the panelists can stick around. We don't have feedback and we can talk to each other. Hi, I just have one. I just wanted to know, how do you deal with a victim of trauma who is perhaps the only player in their situation that they experience, and then they say no? They absolutely refuse to do You know what, I'm just going, it's amazing, because I'm just going to pick up the mic to bring that point out. Because um, whether it's a victim of trauma or just an ordinary interview, um, sometimes they get obstreperous or um, they dig in their heels and they can be abusive. You know, I, I don't mean I'm not talking about this particular case because he was charming and lovely, but I've had, you know, uh, other interviews who, who uh, one of whom, I'll tell you who it was, Tony Randall, who brought me to tears. Um, because there's some mean characters out there, but you have to get the interview. So, you know, you have to, it's that, that is a difficult one to deal with, actually. So if anybody can help me on that one. Can I answer that? And again, this is not as a journalist, and I realize I'm not talking as a journalist, but I think you'd have to ask yourself at what cost? Yeah. At what cost? What is the cost to this person? Now maybe, you know, you're, you're, you're doing that balancing act. Maybe as a journalist, you've got to sacrifice the person for, for, for the greater good or whatever. I don't know, but, but I think that's an important question to ask yourself. The question we ask a lot is, what is the journalistic purpose? And maybe you don't interview the person that day, but you start to build a relationship, and when they're ready to talk, that's you don't the person. Yeah. Yeah. That, you know, you'll, you'll, rather than the one badgering them, 
Yeah. You know, it's a self-interested altruism, if you will. Yeah. Everybody has a bad day. You may approach that person on a day she or he doesn't want to talk. Try 24 hours later, a week, if you've got the time, and you want to get the story. Give that person the chance, and particularly maybe if it's a, if it's a story that's breaking and and is evolving, they too will see how the story is being played in the media, the papers, television, radio. And then what you get a chance to say, it, was, it came up in that wonderful Michael Enright interview a few weeks ago, and I can't remember who the New York Times reporter was. He said, don't forget to ask your interviewee when you get the chance, what do you think the story is? Because we superimpose our assumptions on the story and we go in there with this, you know, question 8, 10, 12. Don't forget to ask them, what do you think the story is? And maybe if it's a story that's ongoing, after a few days or a few weeks, they'll sense that they would like to set the record straight from their perspective. So don't give up if they say no the first time, go back. Because it may be, there may be a better opportunity once the story's beginning to play out. Does that make any sense? Or, um, just one other situation where um, I was interviewing someone who was, um, he was tough, he was a tough individual, but um, I was a bit like a, a terrier. I wouldn't let him get away with it in the end, and I just went in. He was trying to, you know, push me aside. It wasn't it a big, a big, big groundbreaking story, but it was part of a documentary, and I needed him for a documentary I was making for the CBC radio. And I just hung in like a little terrier, and he finally, I wore him down. He finally was, he gave me the information I needed, he was very nice. So sometimes you have to just stick with it. Um, other times, walk away if they're too abusive, the way I look at it. And sometimes frame, if you get the chance, sometimes frame the, the question that you are sensing they're resisting different ways in your list of questions. Sometimes a different way of framing the question will make them understand and feel more open to giving you an answer. I know, again, another veteran story, very quickly, I was interviewing um, an Air Force Spitfire pilot, and he was, he was resistant to my questions about a specific date in his pilot's log. I wanted the story on that day. I interviewed him three or four times before he finally relented and he said, yeah, okay, I'll tell you. Maybe he was saying, okay, you're really persistent. Yeah. I, to a certain extent, I wanted, and it wasn't a traumatic story, it was quite an extraordinary story, but he, he felt as if it were bragging and he didn't want to be in that role. And so when he understood that I was there for more than that story of his rather extraordinary encounter with a historic figure, that it was just another in the stories that he had to offer. And in that context, he felt more comfortable in describing. Sometimes you come back to the same question you were refused on, but phrase it differently. OK, we have one more question in the back, and then so we can. As a journalist, I mean, I'm, uh, until 2008, I've come over to the New York Times and the Washington I loved the tips you gave and all the information. It was wonderful and very informative. And, that's, and I worked in the Middle East. So as the eye contact, I totally agree with you. Because in the Middle East, you're not supposed to look in the eye. It's Where do you look? Eye. Where do you look? You, uh, they don't look in the eye at first. They will at first. They, at they first. won't look. No, they won't they look in the eye at all. I've yeah. that all the time. They won't, it's just disrespectful. Okay. So you either look in your notes and you go on with your notes and you speak in a low voice and that's that's how their culture is. That, that's how they deal with things there. And on the other note, it's there's so it's a whole world of tragedy there in the Middle East. And the people there are traumatized from the day they're born in some areas, like Iraq, where I reported there. So the point, the point is that sometimes they go, I mean, you ask them one question and they go for another. So maybe they have an important point to say. Sometimes you don't have to stick to that story you have in mind. You find another, another story to write about. 
So I think it's very good you brought that up. It's very, very important for, I noticed there's a lot of students out here, which maybe some of them would like to go be freelancers and work for the Middle with this Arab It's very, it's very informative. And uh, on the other notes about the diversity, I'm talking to you with it, and about the story. I mean, if you want to feel that, you see, as I said, you see children who are traumatized. I worked two, for two weeks with children without, with doctors without borders, with children who are totally, I mean, you can't even recognize where's their mouth and their face and their, you can't recognize their faces. But what you can feel better when you write the story and it comes out a strong story and they, after that, they thank you for it. You know, when the child said, thank you for letting my story out, the 12-year-old says, thank you, and he's, you know, he's amputated, he's, he can't walk anymore, or he can't, some of them can't see. It's all kinds of, I mean, explosions there. Thank you for telling our story because now the UNHCR are going to work on it and we're going to go to, come to Canada, or go to the US, or go somewhere else to be treated better. So maybe that's, in my way, in my, for me it was a relief. So I really, really thank you for this. Thank you, I think it, it comes back. It comes back to what we were saying at the beginning, that part of the role of uh, journalists is to give voice to the voiceless and to bear witness, and I think you very eloquently described WAP and it works well, but always at a cost. Um, some good resources, the DART Center uh, for Trauma has a couple of articles on, well there's quite a few actually, ethics and practice in interviewing victims, uh, good kind of good tip sheets, um, and I guess Ellen it's time to uh, break open the, the, the veggie bar there and, and uh, continue the discussion. Thank you all very much.